have a quorum, why don't we go ahead and get started on our work session. We have a lot on the agenda, so um, we can get through and start with our first presentations on class size capacity. And it had not been loaded into Simply. I was giving Mr. Desire more kind of a hard time, but he brought Ms. Faircloth and Mr. Marson to distract me from my ire. Yeah. So you, thank you. you for being here. Um, and we'll. Um, it is now loaded. It is now loaded. So. Okay. And so you can you, you can bring up the presentation and an, uh, an info sheet with a list of schools and interim options that are have been looked at. Uh, the committee again met with all 113 principals last week, worked through each of the schools, sat down and talked to them. The area superintendents had them in groups, and we worked through some information. We have been evaluating that information and updating our list over the past few days. Uh, that is why you are just getting the list now. Uh, the latest information. The is that latest how information. Okay. Mm -hmm. And expect it to change again. Okay. That's the, that's the nature of this beast. Uh, but what we want to do is provide you a little bit more detail today. Also explain the information that we're providing to you so that you can take a look at it on your free time after today. <laughs> and then uh, be prepared for the facilities committee to talk at a lot uh, more detail on each of these items. But again, we are today, if you have any feedback, we're, we'd be more than happy to take some of that feedback today. But if you would, like I said, look at it. And then over the next few days, if you have questions, go ahead and feed them to us in advance or additional information you would like to see the facilities committee let us know so we can bring the right stuff to the facilities committee next week. And so which with that, will be at one o'clock, which will be at one o'clock. And that time changes because we have a school board association, the North Carolina School Board Association district meeting is that evening at four o'clock in Chapel Hill. So that's why we changed the facilities meeting. Thank you, Mr. Fletcher, and all, um, for adjusting to that. So today we have this presentation and then we will be revisiting it at the facilities committee. That's correct. Yes, and so I will turn it over to our facility interpreters, but Glenn and I will have a couple of slides in this one. So. Yeah, we shared. Yeah, no, well, you're, you're uh, going to be free game for us to ask questions at the end, so just be ready. Right. Welcome, Aaron, Kristen. Thank you for coming thank back. You. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you guys having us again. Well, y'all enjoyed your three-day weekend. Joe had us working. That's yeah, why, I, I mean, that's really why we couldn't get this to you sooner. Uh, so hot off the presses. Um, we're just going to recap our challenge um, and the reason that y'all invited us here to share with you. Well, we've been talking about this since April. So. <laughs> um, is that, that we're going to be approximately 9,500 seats short when we begin school for the 18-19 school year. And year-round, that starts July 1st. So we're working ahead of, ahead of that schedule. Um, and then we know that there will be an additional 2,500 kids enrolling in our school system between July 1st of 2018 and when school starts in 2021. Just want to continue to remind ourselves how different and unique we all are, whether we're traditional year-round, whether we're bad, whether we're Title I, overcrowded, under-enrolled. Um, so we do know that there's not one option that's going to um, help us with our solutions, whether it's in our whole area. Um, or individual schools. Um, one of the things that we do keep in mind, or the thing we keep in mind, is making sure that we're meeting students' needs and we're ensuring that students are growing. So every school and every principal is continuing with that focus. So we have the parameters for helping to determine what the recommendations would be. Um, and some of these are new, and so we wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, the spreadsheet that is going to be shared with you. Um, it's already, it's already, already shared with you guys. Um, that data is now filled with the enrollment as of August 25th, so a number of days ago. Um, and then what we did is we just projected <coughs> kindergarten forward for that next school year. Uh, previously, we were, we were working on what if numbers, and now we're dealing more with reality of what students are enrolled in which schools currently. We also want to make sure and note that this information that you are seeing um, does not reflect the potential school assignment for the upcoming school year. It also, we take into account the principal feedback and information that was given at all the meetings that we've had with them. So we had our initial meeting and then 
last week we met with them all again, and that data and information is included in what you'll be looking at as well. And then the information that's not new, of course, is the areas that we looked at, like level of grass, building code, trailers, so forth and so on. All right, so to make it work, this is what all the principals have said that they are going to, be, to do or what they will have to do in order to make it work by July 1st of 2018 if everything stays as it is. Which is also a good thing to point out why we do need to think differently and we need to make some changes is based with stuff on this slide now. So according to that data and information, 40 schools were anticipating having to convert collaborative spaces or computer labs. 24 of them were gonna to have to convert or change special ed classrooms from where they're currently housed or resource classrooms um, to move some of them upstairs if they were serving students who were three, five in a two-story or three-story building. We have approximately 70 schools that are anticipating um, converting some general ed classrooms, um, much like our LEP or AIG um, classrooms, converting them into classrooms or some different spaces there. 39, approximately 39 um, class excuse me, principals are looking to convert other classrooms, those magnets, electives, things like that. We have nine schools who are anticipating converting one of the art or the music classrooms, and 48 of them are anticipating having to convert both of those spaces into classrooms. And we are appro approximately 64 schools are looking at combination classes um, and more than one combination class. And then we have 43 anticipating their fourth and fifth grade um, being over 29 students in a classroom. The combos would all be K-3? We could even do four, all the way through four, four to fifth as well, K-5, depending on where the needs fall and where they can put the allotments to the teachers. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Schools can fall into multiple yes, categories here. Yeah, absolutely. When you have the uh, conversion on your previous slide, is that um, including those that have already done it this year? Yeah, if they had to do it this year, that would be included in there. Yes, that, so yes. Continue, like, you've already had to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's possible hard. this includes those that are already doing it this year that anticipate continuing and continue to do it. And, to do it. That's, and then you. adding those that would have to do it next year that aren't doing it this right. year as well. Thank you. Right. So the updated data that we have now um, is that there were 113 schools that we principals that we spoke with. 22 of those principals anticipate making it work with no changes to their current programs or spaces. And there's 64 that um, that can also make it work, but that means that are converting some sort of space um, and looking to adjust their program, um, which they have, like their art, their music, so forth and so on. And then there are 27 schools that we have identified, and we're bringing those to you because they are going to require some immediate action in order to make this legislation work. We shared, here's a map, if you are able to see where those 27 schools lie by region or area. Lucky me, I drew the short straw. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, you did. <laughs> so getting into here, we're gonna talk about the recommendations that we put forth on the data sheet that you have that accompanies this slide. Um, if you look at the top of the data sheet, you'll see in green and in gold the, um, the different recommendations that um, board is going to make, or that uh, We're having staff to go back is going to make. From screen, yeah, so that's okay. thank, just right. Right. And you'll thank get you into it next, so you don't have to worry about looking at it right now. But basically, they're broken into two types of recommendations one that gains seats which would include a possible redistricting for new schools opening. This would require board approval. Or the adding of trailers to non-program space. Okay? Or um, these would be options that would better utilize seats. You could consider non-base students. Um, you could review the magnet groupings or percentage. We could reduce the base through redistricting, which would require board approval. And then lastly, capping schools, which would require board approval. Um, just to let you know, we took, staff took off the, the table which we had previously considered, which was converting calendars and review, reviewing grade configurations because we felt it would be a little too much at this point to recommend considering all the different things that would need to take place with such moves like that. Um, but moving forward, Joe will explain 
that not all of these options that we have for recommendations are exactly what we want to do. We just need some direction from the board which you would like us to consider first. Okay. And I would like to just add at the end of this sentence, at this time. So this is a kind of a living thing. It's going to be changing as, as we see the students move into our neighborhood. So. Last time we talked to you, we kind of described what was on the spreadsheet at that time. We gave you an example. There are some slight changes to that spreadsheet. Uh, first of all, as mentioned already, we've got the uh, projected membership based on our August 25th students that have registered. Okay, and we use those numbers, age them forward to the kindergarten numbers, age them forward to first grade, and then age the rest of the grades forward. So we use those numbers. The percentages that will be provided in there will be based off of those membership numbers and the new capacity uh, uh, calculations. There may uh, also added to this as previously, we did not show you which ones had grades greater than 29. We've added that column to the spreadsheet. And we've added the combo classrooms. Since there's a large number of those, we added that column into the spreadsheet so you can see which schools are doing that. And with that, at this time, I'll pull up, this, I'll ask you to pull up the spreadsheet. It's the other attachment. <clears throat> and I'll talk through this a little bit for you. So, in the categories that were shown earlier, that uh, they showed you numbers, like the 27, that would require board, operate, uh, board action. Well, we have sorted this spreadsheet into those categories. As you will see, here are the 27 that we're going to require board action. They're at the top of the spreadsheet. And then below that, in alphabetical order, are the 64 that are doing other items also to manage, but they don't need board action here immediately. And then at the bottom will be the 22 schools that are listed alphabetically that at this time do not have an impact on the program. So the focus, will, of course, will be on the 27 up above that need the board action. I'll talk through this a little bit. Uh, you are familiar again with, uh, this basically shows you the current situation based on the projected membership, the crowding. In some places we have added some comments that maybe helped explain why a certain thing is being considered. Uh, we can talk through that more on, uh, at the facilities committee. We have the section where they gain seats and the section that better utilize seats. Now what we have done is now you have every school listed and you have the options considered. Now for the purpose of today's slide, we did take out the column that had the calendar and the, uh, the um, Break, break, break configuration, just so it would be easier to look at this up on the screen. But we will have those back in there for further for facilities committee. So we marked an X in all the options that were considered and discussed with the principals. Some of these, as you know, are already happening. The combo classrooms or, or the uh, conversion of enhancement classrooms to capacity classrooms. What we have done is we grade in the ones there are most likely going to be the first ones that we recommend to you, okay? Now you don't necessarily need to use, you may not need to use all the ones that are grade in, okay? But right now, being conservative, we are marking those as the ones most likely that we will uh, recommend to, to the board. Also, what you will find here is we have highlighted every school that has a um, new school that is opening that will be impacted by the current uh, redistricting plan that you will be seeing in a couple of weeks. Right? So we've, cons we've put that into consideration. We've, made, we've worked closely with, with uh, student assignment on all these items to make sure that they're aware of what we're looking at and we're aware of what they are potentially proposing in the uh, redistricting plan. Again, um, the gray are those areas where we're going to recommend for the board. You will notice that there is a significant number of schools that have Cathy's identified, okay? And we are looking to see if there's anywhere, make sure that there's somewhere for those students to be capped to, 
okay? Art, we do have that in mind when we're looking at this. You will see there are a couple of them, or about a half a dozen or so that are have a dash in them that are gray. That just means they're already capped, but we're going to have to lower that cap. Okay? But the X's are, are newly capped. Thanks. Schools. Possibles. Possibles, correct. Thank you. Joe, sure, two questions. One is when you say consider non base, does that mean uh, likely transfers would no longer be able to retain their transfer to that school? Is that what you mean by consider non base? Yes. And so we have to come up with some agreed upon procedure as to which transfer students would right. get included or not. Okay. And that only and that really only is a viable solution depending on the state of the schools that are their base schools as well. Right, right. right. So right. there's a, it's a it's layers right. to it. Right. So that relates place in their base. It's and that relates to my question about the cap. Is the reason to consider cap as opposed to reassignment? because caps can be done quickly, because we expect this to be a temporary uh, situation. I mean, I don't want to reassign, but a cap means that you're gonna have a, a community where you're gonna have kids going to lots of different schools. Reassignment, uh, well, and, and so the, the cap hurts new people moving into a community. The people that are currently there are gonna keep going to their current school. Reassignment is a longer term solution, but impacts the current community. So I'm just trying to understand the cap versus reassignment argument. Well, you kind of addressed most of it there. I mean, there's all those issues that are involved, and it's a school by school discussion at this time because there are potential, some of these schools are already in the potential uh, redistricting plan. They may be able to help with the situation. So we didn't identify them as a new gray area on here, okay, because that was kind of that was being driven already by the redistricting plan. Uh, but otherwise here, it's it's really it falls down to a school to school decision, which one is gonna be the best fit to stick with your policy. But again, a cap, are you see, are you seeing this to be a temporary thing? I mean, a, oh, ca yes. a cap, a cap is a short term. All these are solution. Pretty much temporary. It's not really a solution. It's an accommodation. Other than the re the redistricting for the new schools, for a large part, almost all of this is will probably be temporary. Okay. This is to get you a solution for eighteen nineteen. Okay. Knowing that we got to continue working this for these twenty seven, and. The majority of those in the bottom part. We still need to continue working a long term solution. And I would assume we need, we're going to need data to see how many kids are in the base because some bases may not be needed to be adjusted if the transfers are really high. We don't need to reassign. So I think we'll just need more layers, as you say, to make those decisions. Mr. Sutton, did you have a question? I saw your hand. Yeah, I, mean, I was just going to. To the point you were making, Joe, it, it seems like each case or situation is going to vary perhaps significantly by school to school. So I'm just thinking about the position we're going to be taking or you all are going to be asking us to take as a board. Is it kind of this menu of, what well, I'm kind of hearing these menu of things, but then does that still give you all the flexibility you need to kind of handle each one on a case by case. Does that, does that make sense? <coughs> the staff will would love to hear any preferences the board has on making those decisions. Ms. Hartenstein, the non-base students. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Are you done, Mr. Sutton? But, but, I, but, but I do believe it can vary from school to school. Yeah. I don't think there's going to be a one-size solution here. It's going to be it's going to be a menu. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it will. Yeah. So I guess what I'm thinking in terms of whatever it is that we end up sort of ultimately voting. How do we create a man to change a policy or what have you that gives you the flexibility that you need to be able to have that many options for each school? I'm trying to figure out sort of what that 
what that ask is down the road and, and even sort of sifting through the direction you're needing from us today. This is where I just say that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> We're not that far down. You know me. <laughs> yeah. No, but it, it's, <coughs> it's, devil will be in the details on this. Mm -hmm. And today's, you are not expecting, uh, we are, this is for information for us to take into consideration, ask for more data, and then take up again in the facilities, and, and then I, later in September with the assignment plan. So we've got time but to I'm ask this question. I did hear immediate, and I heard sort of at this time, but I hear some sense of urgency. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much sort of a exchange of, okay, we need more data, need more data, need more data, but then at some point you all have got to, so sort of decision has to be made. The example would be just to, there are really some schools where tapping decision will need to be made sooner, a lot sooner than other schools, just because of the situation at the school. Martinstein, yeah. Ms. Mahaffey, Mr. Fletcher, Ms. Cash, then Mr. Fletcher. On the non-base students, that would be from this point forward. Not, we're not talking about the students that are non-base that are currently enrolled there. We're talking about the students that are non-base currently enrolled there. Currently enrolled. So you would be able to give us data on how many students that have we, if we sent them back to base, um, how much, uh, how many students that would affect our open seats for? I can tell you how many students and what their May school is. I have that. Okay, so down the road, okay. Do we know in those, do we know in those 27 schools how many students we're talking about? Total, I don't have a total number. I have them broken down by school. We have Okay. Yeah. Um, I appreciate the fact that we're looking at this on a school by school basis because I'm just seeing schools in my area. If you send kids back to base, that base is on this list as well. So that doesn't really help. Are we looking at options of, you know, renting out facilities or is there, I mean, what's on the menu and what isn't, you know? Using, I, I I don't know I I guess again it's it's for, for the non-base and Glenn correct me if I'm wrong we're wherever we put an X we've taken a look at it and we're looking at the possibility that there's so there is some of those students can go back to their base maybe not all of them but not as Kathy said it would be a layered decision so we can look at which school base schools could accommodate the students and we can look at those first. Lindsay, we've looked at, well, we've looked at all of these schools, but when right. we look at the non-base, let's say there's 50 non-base transfer students at the school, when you parse that back to where they belong uh -huh. to, you might have 25 schools, so you're only sending one or two okay. to an individual school. So if, if, if we, you know, come to you with that recommendation, it's going to be minimal impact on the receiving school. Okay. Yeah, all right, that's, yeah. that's helpful. That's Thank a you. big ask, considering that. You know, well, and, and we let these kids transfer, and now we're sending them back. I realize it's no fault of our own, and we have to follow the legislation. And just and we've worked hard to yeah. offer choice to parents when we can. Mm -hmm. And now those that opportunity, that, that of the ability for us to do that, is now constricted. Right? Some of those bases will be a different calendar. <coughs> yeah, Miss Cash and. Fletcher, um, what, I, don't, I hesitate to talk about this too much, but in reflection to um, what Dr. Martin said and, and then also in your, your area, you know, this is similar to like, heck, when we looked at, we were capping always is kind of a bad thing. It's, to me, it seems like a, it, we should be looking at reassignment instead of the capping because long-term is so much better for our bus transportation system and for families as a whole. I know we look at stability as important, but at one point in my life, we had we looked at similar figures like this, and that's when we started doing more multi-track and more reassignment because gross was just overtaking schools and capping just never worked out to be the best issue. So I hope we look at the reassignment as an important part of this plan. 
I would just remind again, this is an interim, interim. Yeah. Yeah. option. We still will need to look at long-term yeah. solutions. That's an interim recommendation. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'd like some, some practical feedback from principals or, or others. Um, we were talking about uh, base assigned to a school, not capped. Anyone who moves into that base during the year goes to that school, knocks on the door, says, I'm here, I got a kindergartner and a second grader. And the school is expected to manage the growth of those students and take those students in. And whatever you have to do to satisfy state law and keep the superintendent's job uh, needs to be done within the school. The, the capped so that's base assignment regardless of the calendar, okay? So the cap situation then would be when the school can no longer make any accommodations, whether it's combining classes or reorganizing, there's no more teaching space, I'm guessing. Talk to, you know, or give me some feedback about uh, why, when it moves from take care of the kids who live in the base to we've done all we can and now we can't take any more or we've got a health and safety issue or we're, we're way outside, we're gonna be outside the statute. Uh, that's when the cap would seem to be necessary. Am I misinterpreting that or do we see a cap being necessary before we reach that point? We may set a cap and say the cap number is X. Correct before it's ever reached. Right. We, could, we, we typically do that. That's typically the way we work, but, yes. but the cap would be set somewhere around that number that says the school is exhausted their space and their personnel, and therefore anybody else who moves in will have to go to a different school where there might be a crack. I, I think so. I think another reason that a cap in the first year makes sense here anyway is also because we're, we're kind of... Um, as we see how the new legislation is implemented by DPI and how they count and calculate the district average, that's going to be important as well, um, because there is there still maintains there's still a cushion of a plus three there for an individual class size, <coughs> and so but we have to make sure that we don't exceed the district class average. So it's very important to understand how DPI is going to calculate that class average. And so a cap could very well be a temporary solution should we find that we have room to implement the plus three. Well, there's no... We won't know, we don't, we, I mean, that's going to take us a little while to know. Okay, the, it, but it is, it is either class size or district? There's not an interim measurement? Uh, if you hit over 23 in any individual class, you immediately must address it. If you are over 20 at the point in time that DPI takes the average, the district is out of compliance and whatever sanctions are in place are in place. As a district or as a school? As a district. But the, 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 so the school-based constraint is the class size, is a single class size of 23 or more? Yes. But they also have to have an average of 20, do they not? Right now, the district, the entire district, we have asked our schools to have an average class size of 20 as we see how DPI implements the formula for calculating the district average. So you can't take the chance. Okay. Um, I, what you're asking. I don't know how we do that. But. Oh, that's hard. Miss Mahaffey, Miss Carter. Huh? Whatever we decide, I hope, I want whatever when we message this to parents, I hope we let them know the reason behind this, because I think it's it's a hard ask. You know, some of these schools haven't been open very long. Um, you know, so if you're a transfer student and you've only been there two or three years and then you're being told to move back to your base, it, that's, that's a big ask. Or if there's a cap and you move into the area, you knock on the school door and they say, well, Yes, we're your base school, but you're going to go here. I, I think we need to be intentional so that we understand as a community why this is happening, um, and and that we also start messaging some of those long-term solutions as well, so people don't think that this is going to be the the environment that we're in 
Well, let me, long term. Let me piggyback on yeah. that because the, the reason we're doing this is that the budget passed by the legislature removes all the flexibility that we had in elementary school to do it differently. And so it is, it is a lack of understanding of what the previous interpretation of the state budget allowed that has been taken away. And we're seeing the ramification, ramifications of that, both in terms of, uh, I mean, Dr. Martin brought up um, in a previous meeting that if the goal is to reduce class size and to improve instruction, how does having two classrooms share, two classes share a classroom, or having so many blended grades, a two, three classroom, improve instruction for both of those types of students, or to have 35 kids in a four or five classroom, improve instruction for those kids. So the, 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 the stated objective is being, um, is being thwarted by the solution that's been required. And so that, that they, there needs to be some rational discussion about that with the folks who made the decision that this is the right, the right um, allocation strategy for every school in North Carolina, because it certainly isn't going to improve instruction for the majority of our kids. So how do we message that to parents? Because Good if question. it's my kid, I'm I'm not going to look well, very far past the door. Of what the staff school. is what staff yeah. is looking at are individual responses. Right. No. I way. mean, someone who's got a transfer, and we say we want you to go back to your base school. That's an individual response to this state mandate for class size. I understand that. So, and that 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 boils down to one-on-one -on -one appeal to the board. I mean, just a whole lot of angst and confusion. Uh, on the part of our uh, constituents and our clients. Mr. Hartenstein, let me straight you. A question about the combo classrooms is I lost it. Joke up. Oh, there. <laughs> is uh, is that um, like a two-three or a one-two combination, so or does that also include two teachers with um, thirty kids in a room? The no, same grade level? a combination two grades. Two grades. Yes. So, do we know how many of our schools are already? We didn't have that data. to a level that we can present it to you. Okay. That, and has that? Uh, translators. <laughs> how many of those are working now? Yeah. When you uh, got feedback from the principals, what was the cons census or was there one was it even spoken about having one of the ways to create more space is to put two classrooms in one classroom space with two teachers again i think it's based on individual schools and when you're looking at a do you have this uh, a room that has the space to right do so. so some of our older schools have bigger rooms have much larger rooms yes. uh -huh. that it's definitely doable and probably folks would focus more on possibly doing it in the first grade since their class size restriction would be at 16 so that's less students in that in that um, classroom unlike some other schools that are newer schools the classrooms aren't quite as large so I think you know again every, it goes by school by school and what the situations are there and we, we will clarify for the uh, okay. updated conversation and facilities conversation who is what the what the frequency is of those who are talking about combo classes mixed grade levels versus a combo class that involves a large space with two teachers and two sets of students. Or even a space that they may not be what we would call large, but they're still using it with. Large enough for 30 students. <laughs> yeah. Works a little easier with little first graders than it does big fifth graders, so. It's very good. Listening to all this, uh, the one thing that keeps coming back to mind, and I and I have this many times sitting here listening, is uh, we just got such a seating deficit, and operating the building program with a 15% seating deficit year over year has really put us in this situation. I haven't heard anything said about looking at a long-term change to providing a whole lot more seats. We need a lot more seats. I've heard a lot of things about 
oh, that we, we've, uh, we've changed to LED lights. We're doing all these different things in the building that cost more money, but we're not building any more seats. And our whole problem here is the lack of seats. That seems to be what we really have to be hitting on and somehow making a change, you know. You keep doing the same thing over and over and getting the same results, 15% seating deficit, that's not the right thing. So we'll, um, the, the ones that are highlighted with Buckhorn Creek and Bryan Road opening, is it anticipated that that would be the only solution needed for those three schools on that list of 27? Or um, can you get to, to the um, issues of, because there's some additional seats, but I agree with you, Mr. Agee, we're not getting them fast enough. Um, but would, as an example, if perhaps not if to, not today, but if, on Wednesday at facilities, we could look at whether or not Fuquay Verena Elementary the opening of Buckhorn Creek in and of itself could relieve that school for 18, 19? Well, they're still got considered non-base there as well. I got, you. I got you. Well, preliminarily what we've looked at, if you see that it has a highlighted recommendation, it's in the top 27, <coughs> we are concerned that that redistricting will not be not be enough, okay. right? And in some cases, the fact that it's on there is only because it's a little bit, it's a domino effect and it's a minor impact. But we wanted to make sure that we acknowledge that there is some impact from the opening. None, none of us disagree that we need to be building more seats, but I think we also have to recognize that we're already competing with ourselves, driving up the cost of construction. So, I mean, I'm not sure we can be building a lot faster than we currently are. Uh, if so, I've not seen where that money is going to come from or where the labor to build the schools is going to come from. So I agree with you, Don, that we need to continue to be building. But, uh, you know, I, to just say that it's a, it's a seating deficit I'm so, that does not solve the, the problem because we are, since we, well, for the last, what, three to five years, we've been building pretty much at maximum capacity. We're running out of labor. What do you mean? There, we're, our demand is high enough that we're driving our own cost of construction up. Well, Not so only do we have to build our schools. The market has rebounded. The market is rebounded. Demanding more construction. We're building. Home construction is building. Uh, other, other light industry is building. But our demand is driving <laughs> up our own price. And so. You know, yeah, we could build more, but it's going to—it's going to be—it's going to be more costly, and we're having a difficult time right now, arguing the dollars to the commissioners as it is. So, I mean, I agree with you. We've got to keep building, but um, well, that—that's not. It's easier said than done. Well, I, I guess that I'm the opinion that that we could do do a little bit better. When we look at the growth and the cost of the elementary schools, we went from a. $10 million elementary school to we're over $35 million in uh, about 12 years. I think that uh, that speaks volumes in itself. There, there's because a, a we're competing with ourselves and driving the cost up. And it's a bigger school. Yeah. A bigger school. 800 student school. The, As opposed to a 600 student school. Uh, we can look at the, uh, there's been uh, schools built from the same design that we've seen the, the growth in the price very dramatic and, and that's because they may have been the same basic design but there were other features put into those schools not that were not there the first bill okay so are you no. saying build more build faster build cheaper what yeah, you all, all, all of those On the next, um, well, it'll be a, um, uh, ample we're discussion we're for facilities yeah. Wednesday. Yeah. I think we that needs to be in the parking lot for that discussion. Right. 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 And I am assuming our CIP assumptions um, have now been adjusted to include cap class size capacity limits. Um, we're, working we're working on that. Okay. A lot of moving parts. I'm <coughs> that, Mr. Oh, sorry, back to the board other questions, clarifications. 
so in looking at the um, the chart, if it has an X next to looking focusing on the 27 schools, any or all of those solutions may be needed, or a subset of those. those wherever there's an X, we've looked at those as possible options. Right now, for each school. Okay, that's the ones in gray are the new ones that are already in place that we are looking at probably being the first ones that will come to you as recommendation. One or two or, or three of them, okay. all depending on the school situation itself. And on Wednesday at facilities, are we going to go through each of those schools and look at each different case? Because as we've been told, each school is going to have different needs and um, options before it. Well, what I've heard, we've got, we've heard some of the information, the additional data that you're interested in, some of the base, right, base penalty, numbers, yes. those numbers, and so we can come back to you with that information on top of this, and, we're, and probably would be best, I'm just thinking ahead, that if there's certain schools you want to discuss, that we'll go through those first. Okay. So, just so I understand, so of, of the, well, I think I understand, all of these that are being capped as a possibility, you, there's only six of those that have an X under redistricting. Is that because there's no room to redistrict two? No, actually going to be five. No, six, I can count the six. Um, there's only six that can have any space they can redistrict to. Is that why they're only looking at that as an option of six of those 27 schools? So which six are you talking about? Well, on that right, she's talking about the ones where we have X's in the column for reduce. Reduce base, base by redistricting. Base by redistricting? Just. So like Harris Creek. Yes, Holland start Chapel. in there. Uh, they are not schools that we've looked at considering for the draft one proposal. But of the, the 27, most of them are, have an X under cap, but only six of those have an X under redistricting. Is that because the other, 20, the other 21 or so, not including the new ones, don't have a space to redistrict to? Uh, I can't answer that. I mean, other than the sense we just haven't looked at those schools. Some of these um, Xs may have come from school recommendations, so they wouldn't be recommendations okay. that we had put up there. Makes sense. That'd be a question I'd be curious about. More than that, are redistricted though, because you've got the redistricting for new school openings. Yes, yeah, that I get. And that will redistrict some of the others. And I, I wondered if that's been taken into consideration. So we, we can ask that yeah. as we get deeper into the facts. Good point though. So when we get um, when we get the draft one um, assignment plan, will that include? Um, the assignment areas for Buck, Buckhorn and um, Bryan Road. And that's on the 19th, still planned for September 19th. Yes. But it won't include for the 1920 ones. Uh, there's just the one school, the YMCA. Uh -huh. that, that'll be the only attendance area that we proposed during that time. Okay. Mr. Sutton. Yeah. Um, so looking at the timeline, it would be helpful to have a little bit more information in the timeline. So if I could sort of maybe push a little bit to ask for at least some idea of the specific decisions that you need us to make or going to ask us to make. Because it sounds like there might be some facilities decisions, there might be some reassignment decisions or some that might kind of fall in both perhaps <coughs> and when those what those are or what they might look like when they're going to be in sort of a, a drop date a drop dead date so that everything else kind of stays on schedule both reassignment wise particularly reassignment wise but if there's anything else that impacts be it CIP or whatever because it's not just part of the assignment plan it's going to be other decisions, I think, Mr. Sutton. Has but I feel like I'm hearing yeah. that there are kind of some right. a lot of moving. Well, what you're parts. seeing on the list right now, the way we've identified it, is capping is the main one that the board is going would weigh in from an approval point of view. You'd weigh in on any of them, of course. 
but that's the one that we bring forward to you for an approval. We're looking at the timing of that. Uh, as you see here, they're potentially bringing some of that to discuss with you in September 19th along with the assignment with the redistricting plan that's going on. The others are tend to be things that we can manage internally in house and we would be working towards them, but we would want feedback from you if you prefer not to to go with them. There's been a lot of discussion about the uh, reducing base. So that may be one that you would say you prefer us to do it first or do it after capping, do capping first. That's the kind of feedback we'd want to hear from you at, at the next meeting. And that would be on the, this time frame here on September 19th. Otherwise, our goal was to give as much information to the student assignment office so that they could incorporate anything that needed to be incorporated into the enrollment plan or district plan. Mr. Fletcher. Just reflecting on what's on that. It would seem that the, the cap number could be established and the date could be established when the, if the school tells us what their absolute maximum capacity would be. We could do that for all the schools at one time. Clarity. Something to think about. The second would be um, there would seem to need some kind of policy or maybe the policy guides R&P, but we're talking about a fairly significant change relative to students who have transferred that currently enjoy an automatic renewal at the same school. And so that would seem to have a policy implication that we'd have to deal with. Um, the redistricting is straightforward within what we do each year uh, when we're opening new schools. It, it has a different connotation when we're moving from base from existing to existing, I'm just trying to think through the what what we would need the board to do from a policy standpoint. Um, I'm doing the same. So I'm, as I'm thinking about that, that seems that there is going to be a sequence of decisions that might that might come through policy, that might come through facilities, or. Uh, yeah. And that what is that order or sequence here. I mean, I, 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 I hear in this, you kind of give us a heads up on there's going to be some capping and some other stuff that we're going to need you to. Well, we could set on. a cap date and number for these 27 schools and take other action. <coughs> so that the cap date, the cap number was never reached. I mean, they're, they're not, they're, they're not. Uh, um. Okay. Just because the cap doesn't mean we have to get there. Right. right. And we have several so schools that are capped that haven't reached their cap today. Because capping involves, if you cap a school, you actually give transportation to a child you send somewhere else. That's been our practice. And we are, we do have policy 4150, that's continuation of student assignment transfer policy, so that is going to be later today, if not. Maybe we should go straight to that. So I'll leave it on the agenda where it is right now. Dr. Mark. So I appreciate the complexity of this work, and I'm glad we're working on it. And I agree with you, we've got to have a timeline. My question is are we just accepting this is the way it is, or are we still running a parallel lobbying effort, maybe with Mr. Crowder, to our legislature to? Carefully articulate, because I don't think a lot, right, this is difficult for us to understand. I don't think a lot of the legislators understand the impact. I know the public doesn't understand the impact. It's tough for us to fully understand the impact. But are we crafting a message that we can take back to our legislators and say, uh, you know, we're, we are doing our best to comply with the law, but before this gets put into effect, we're again petitioning for help and change. Do we have that effort going on? Um, and if not, should we not activate it? Because we've got a lot of good information, and you all have provided some very good talking points, and frankly would be great ambassadors to the legislative delegation as well. Or are we just accepting that this is the way it's going to be? 
we can increase our efforts. But I'm, I'm looking at a quote from a leader in the legislature. Uh, what may need, quote, what may need to be done in Wake may not be the same as what's needed in Onslow. We need to work together to find a satisfactory solution rather than scream that the sky is falling. Some of our principals think the sky is falling. Legitimately mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So, um, so there's a little bit of that mindset we've got to work on. But that's partly the issue because they've imposed right. a one-size-fits-all. Right. Exactly. And even we and Wake can't do a one-size-fits-all. We size can't do one-size-fits-all. Right. Right. And so even taking their language, we need to go back and say, if you want, don't change the whole thing, but we have to have relief here. We'll redouble the work. Yeah. I, I, mean, I was just saying because I was sitting there thinking our, our other boards and districts going through this same exercise and I would say probably not or maybe some similar but given our size and complexity probably probably not at, at this level so I think strategy wise if you're thinking about it I think this is still very much an effort and exercise that we would need to go through so if there is a redoubling, redoubling of the efforts this is the kind of information you would need Absolutely. in that. I don't know that it's just <laughs> crafting well, a few talking points no, and no. going in and again screaming the sky's falling. <clears throat> this gives some real impact for our delegation and others to see this is how it's affecting us. Yep. Here's what it looks like. Here are the strategies we're, we're considering. Here's gonna, how it's going to impact students. This is how it's going to impact teachers, families. Reassignment, the whole nine yards. This gives a much more detailed picture that you would need to use if we're going to move. I completely agree. Anybody that's at the General Assembly, I think, to, that, to the point that statement. Well, so. and Dr. Merrill's point and yours, I think we've got to target the Wake delegation, not the full leadership. The Wake delegation has got to go to bat for us and say, hey, <clears throat> This is the local impact. Ms. Mahaffey had a I'm sorry. comment. If you want to. I, I'm just thinking of our, our long-term solutions, and we have our, our rolling SIP, and we have a great need everywhere in our county for middle schools and high schools. Does this mean we have to relook at construction in, in order to get those long-term elementary solutions forward sooner? It's, and this I, is going to impact I mean, everything. It, it's... Yeah. You know, we say it's K-3 class size, but it's something that just goes across the board. So it, there's, there's a finite amount of money right. for capital construction. Mm -hmm. If we build another elementary school, that's some other school we don't build. Right. Or renovate. Or renovate. Exactly. So, yeah, it's a finite. I mean, we have a 300 to 350 million target number with the county for every year based on our agreement. Uh, so how that number gets changed over time, and it's not a number we can change now, right? Because it's it's committed mm -hmm. for our ongoing projects. So we can change what the mix of schools as we move forward, those projects that haven't begun. The to the point of who does this impact? We've got. It's my understanding that, that fewer than 15 districts in North Carolina are actually growing, actually adding students. It's those districts that would have the issue. Okay, Green County is losing kids every day. Um, they may not have the issue, but, but the growing districts will, and there's some commonality among us, I'm sure. And to that point, I think if there's any solution that comes out of the General Assembly, it would be one that would be sort of tailored to, I think, a specific group of districts, be it the growing districts, the 10 larger districts, or, or something. I don't know that it would be kind of a... I can't. I don't foresee it being that. No, I agree. Tori. That's probably good. Yeah. <coughs> we got the best presentation. Well, this information and the, 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 the effort to involve the people on the ground, the principals, to say, what can I do with my facility and my staff, and how, do we, how, can, we, how can we attempt to deliver quality instruction uh, and meet these standards, uh, these physical barriers? Um, I think that's the, it's it's yeah. tremendously well done, and I appreciate the effort that's that's gone into it. Thank you, Thank you. Mr. Blumberg. Did you have just one one thought? I mean, this this issue may require that you all consider where you draw the line between staff and board decision making when it comes to capping 
um, revoking transfers or reassignments. Um, and just to give that pause, do you want to lay out broad parameters about these are our preferences when it comes to the options on addressing class size um, and, and then delegate to the administration that they can cap a grade or a school or reassign a student as necessary <laughs> to comply with the class size requirements so that it doesn't have to come to the board on each one of those times for situations. And that's a little bit where Keith was coming from is, you know, how we, how are we going to draw this in a way that's workable? Is it going to be, you know, every instance it comes has to come back to the board? And that was where Bill was sort of saying, do we do, just want to come up with a formula and then have the staff handle it? So, I mean, I think this does create a little bit of a new dimension to how you draw those lines. And having a timeline of when we make our decisions and that staff can then follow through with those decisions. That's sort of where yes. I was going. Yes. And I, I found That's out what I hear. We need to, I think we as a board need to push ourselves that to get that done and have that timeline and get it done so that then staff has that flexibility to do what I'll they agree. need to do. And having a timeline um, and specifics will be needed thinking back, back to the spring, I think we have some examples of how we need to make some firm decisions. So I think that's an excellent point. We have a tendency to kind of keep yes. pushing for information because we may not want to make a, a tough decision. Any final decision. comments before you move on? I, have to I, I, to I just mm -hmm. don't want to see us um, to the point that was just made, you know, come out in April and say, okay, this school has a cap, we're not taking transfers, and everybody's going back to base. That doesn't help with the, the stability piece. If you're going to, if we're going to be doing something, the sooner we can get information to families, I think the better. Um, just so they can start making changes for what's going to work for, for their families. Um, excellent point. Any other comments before we move on? And uh, again, two, th two things coming up on work session. Um, the application changes that we will be having to Ms. Mahaffey's point, as well as the policy issues that have already been raised. Um, so that, stay tuned, just a few more minutes. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, but first, we have um, the thank you very much both to, um, mm -hmm. to Marcin, uh, our principals, and uh, now we're going to move to the um, bus driver compensation schedule. That was uh, loaded onto your board materials this morning. Uh, the latest information again. And um, just as a reminder, is this also on our action agenda for tonight? We all have different opinions on how to this item is being um, fast forwarded. It's going to be on tonight's agenda. <laughs> Thank you, Don. <laughs> I know. We got Mr. Snydmiller and Mr. Dieter. There are a lot of options that are the most effective. I mean, that's something I might disagree on. I think Kathy's not. See my neck is gone. Cleaner. Yeah. Coming to us with bus driver compensation update. You want me to start or wait? Yes. Sometimes you gotta pull it out. Yeah, just, um, so we have to do. We'll give him two more minutes. Okay. Thank you. I didn't. Thank you for noting. I didn't know. If you had a size of lunch, but we we should have started more multi track in Western Way. Flowers put off high renovation in Western Elmer. So I can build a new element. So probably not. Not this weekend because we're going to have something out of town. So. I'd rather they say, go to their parents and say, go to the multi track or you go to Yeah. 
All right. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to review with you our recommendations um, for revising the bus driver compensation schedule for the 2017-18 year. And before I start, I'll just make the brief comment that after that last presentation, just about anything we come across is good news. <laughs> so this really is some good news. This is good news. So um, you'll recall that the state approved for non-certified staff for this year a $1,000 compensation increase. That applied to all non-certified staff except for bus drivers. And the reason there's the except is the state did recognize that there was a significant challenge with both recruiting and retaining bus drivers. And they included in their final budget legislature a statewide $16.8 million compensation increase for bus drivers. Our initial estimates since Wake is about 10% of the state's population was that we'd received $1.68 million. When we got our actual allotment in a couple weeks ago, it was higher, which is again good news. It came in right at $2.2 million. Um, and the recommended schedule that you see in a couple minutes does utilize that full $2.2 million. So as we looked at how to apply that funding to the schedule, we looked at what were the major issues we got. The first one is just the starting rate of $12.55 an hour we recognize is not competitive. Second, as I'll show you in a second, there's rate compression that came from year over year, um, lack of change to compensation levels. And then finally, we have inconsistent step differentials. So again, there's the beginning rate of $12.55. And then you see starting at step one all the way through step six, $12.93 an hour. So on this current schedule, bus driver, from step one to step two, we'll see no change. From step two to step three, we'll see no change, and so on and so forth, until step seven. That is assuming the legislature doesn't do something in any given year. And steps should be understand as years. Correct. Is there any other way to go from step to step? No. Um, and then another um, challenge is if you look down to step 15 under the current schedule, uh, excuse me, 13, it takes a driver 13 years or that's at before they crack the $15 an hour threshold. And that $15 an hour rate is our current ultimate target for a beginning rate, step zero. So here's our recommendation. It begins to address the starting rate issue by getting up to $13.11 an hour. It addresses the compression issue. It takes it out totally. And it addresses the inconsistent step differentials. Here you'll see the inconsistent steps. You know, in those years where it's compressed, there's no change. And then you see 28 cents, 27 cents, 14 cents between steps, 50 cents. 20 cents, it's all over the place. The new proposed schedule has consistent 27 cents between each step. The time, um, so it addresses those things and the time to cross that $15 an hour threshold now drops from step 13 down to step seven. So again, it's not everything we'd like it to be but it uses up to $2.2 million, and to go further would require more funding. <coughs> um, so we think it's a good step in the right direction. That being said, nothing's easy. When we compare the recommended bus driver schedule to our bus driver team lead effective hourly rate, we see that the differential and, and this is the bus driver team lead rate, and they're the ones who got the $1,000 increase. But they're doing similar, not identical, but similar work to the bus driver team leads. They're, and during this period of bus driver shortages, the similar is more like bus drivers during the morning and afternoon. They're driving buses, but then they have supervisory duties in the district. These team leads are full-time as opposed to the bus drivers that are working their morning run 
taking a couple hours off working their afternoon run. So these bus drive team leads got the $1,000 increase. And even with that $1,000 increase, once you get past, I think it's step three, with a recommendation for increase in the bus drivers, now would be making less per year, or less per hour, let me restate that, yeah. less per hour than the bus drivers. So we've got an equity issue with that. So our, as we looked at the, again, bus driver team lead schedule, it not only has this equity issue that we created with our recommendation, but it true has compression issues. $14 per hour on those same steps. It's got the same inconsistent um, step differential. You can see that there. And it's got the equity issue. So what we're recommending to address that issue is to provide funding beyond the $1,000 increase such that for the bus driver team leads, every bus driver team lead at any step level would make 50 cents more per hour than the bus driver at that same step. And that is based on it as we looked at the current differential between the bus driver on any given step and the bus driver team lead on any given step. It's all over the place, but it averages right around 50 cents. So that's our recommendation. And again, what that does, it addresses the equity issue. It gives us consistent differentiation between the bus drivers and the bus driver team leads, 50 cents at every step. And it also gives us consistency on the team lead schedule from step to step, that same 27 cents per step. So it addresses all those issues. But it comes with a price. And that price is about $88,000 of additional funding required. And that's separate from the $2.2 million. And that $2.2 million we received from the state cannot be used to fund the bus driver team leads. It can only be used for the bus drivers. So our recommendation is to use the business case that remained in the final budget. Um, it was pared down significantly, but there was $264,000 remaining in the business case for market competitive compensation. And so we're recommending that we use 88,000 of that 264,000 to adjust the, bus, adjust the bus driver team lead schedule. So again, a very good step forward, again, our goal is to get, and this goal will move with time, uh, is to get that entry level to the $15 an hour range. <coughs> Still more work to be done. The state did, the state budget did direct DPI to conduct a study um, about bus driver compensation and related recruitment and retention issues associated with bus drivers and report back to the legislature by April 1st. 2018. So they're still interested in it. If I recall correctly, um, the House's version of the budget not only had the $1.68 million <coughs> this year, but they also included another $1.7 million for the 1718 to increase bus driver compensation further. That didn't make it to the final budget, though. We may be bringing a business case back next spring for the 1718 proposed budget to request local funding as well to address this issue. So if the board does support the recommendations, we are going to request action at tonight's meeting. I know that's not normal to request action on the same evening that we present it. And the primary reason for this um, is if, we, if you do support it and you can approve it tonight, we can get it uh, into the September payroll. If it does need to wait, we'll certainly understand that. We'll get it into the October payroll. And the last thing I'd say before I'll, I'll finish up and ask for questions, I'd just like to recognize Rachel Heitzen. She's in the room from the Teamsters. She was instrumental in opening the door with Representative Nelson Dollar and inviting Bob and his team to the table. And that's what really, I believe, led to um, this legislation providing this funding, led it to happen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Great so, advocacy. Glad to answer any questions. Now, how many um, vacancies do we currently have for bus drivers? Um, how many vacancies? How many bus drivers right now? 7, 40? Yeah, we have roughly 7, 40. Um, We've got more. I mean, it depends how many okay. we can add. We've eliminated some positions now. If you recall, part of our budget adjustments um, to balance the budget for the current year was to further reduce the Transportation Department's budget by, I think it was $3 million. And that was because we can't hire enough bus drivers. So when and if we are in a position to be more competitive and we can add bus drivers and then do things like reduce and maybe eliminate shared runs, add additional buses on some runs that are stretched and to reduce ride times, those sorts of things, we're going to have a funding challenge because we've just removed a lot of funding associated with those vacant positions. Yes, Mr. Ag. Currently, is uh, all these positions that you've told us about 100% state funded? Is there any local funds being used? Bus drivers are all state funded, correct, Bob? Yeah, that's correct. They're all state funded. And the leads? Yes. But this particular fund was only for the bus drivers, not yes. the leads. And so, so that it. additional 88000 we are requesting local funds. It's local. We're, kind of a, we're not calling it a supplement, but effectively that's what it is. <coughs> I was just going to say, we've talked about this a lot. I'm very pleased to see this step in the right direction. So I'm completely in favor of bringing it for action at tonight's meeting. So just yes. keeping it on action yeah. agenda Absolutely. where it is yeah. now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Any objections? No, no objection. I, I think uh, I support it as well and bringing it forward tonight. I do think Mr. Nita's point is a good one about the funding that was taken from transportation and how we might address that because I think this will particularly have a tremendous impact on our uh, private contractors that particularly provide our special uh, needs students for transportation as we move our rate up for our drivers that makes it even more of a challenge for them and what they're paying. They haven't been able to keep their drivers. No, good point. They would want to come work for Wake County. So a good problem to have for us, but I think that puts pressure on our contractors at the same time. So Market pressures are real, yes. Any further questions for Mr. Nader? We'll get another chance in the action agenda if you think of something else. And uh, today is the 100th anniversary of uh, bus transportation learned from NCDPI. And Oriental 100 years ago was the first um, use of uh, school uh, transportation. So um, uh, I think the statistic was of $1.5 million, well, 1.5 million public school children in North Carolina, 780,000 take the bus, the yellow bus. And that's about the same proportion as here in Wake County. So. Um, a lot of children get to school on yellow buses, so it's great that we're making these strides for our drivers. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, moving on. Our next, um, our next item, continuation back to uh, student assignment is policy and issues. Um, we've got Kathy Moore, Ms. Evans, Rosa's back talking about um, proposed application changes for the 18-19 school year. Continuation discussion, and you should have your materials loaded. This is part two, three, four. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> We're analog, not digital, you don't need to keep track. <laughs> <laughs> little interlude back to similar discussions that variations on a theme with yeah, all like these the, other ones. The first slide's heading, why are we here? <laughs> so we are continuing a discussion. This is the, I think third third work session in a row that we've come back and talked a little bit about this. But there's been some there were some specific questions um, <coughs> um, not forty one fifty. The um, student assignment presentation. Um, 
opportunity to, to talk about some of the feedback that the board provided and some of the changes that are being incorporated into the uh, the application process and in some places where um, we may want to have further discussion. So. Is it on the desktop? Which one? And they have the policy. Yes. The student the policy on. first? No. No. This, this is, is the continued first. discussion for the proposed application changes. Right. 1819. We can get it off simply if it's not up there. Thank you. The first slide title, Why Are We Here? On there simply. Yep. Okay. Go ahead, sorry. It's the one that's policy. Right, it's the one before it, yeah. That one there. Thank you. All right, so we're following up. Um, and, and it, this goes all the way back to April. <laughs> We've been talking about it since then. Um, so you've, all, you've asked for the additional details for implementation, and I'm going to let Glenn take it over in terms of um, the places where we've made some changes or adjustments. Okay, so again, this is just a recap of the things that we are bringing to you for the discussion. Um, specifically, talking about the prioritization of the applications. Again, this is how we prioritize early college over magnet over year round, and we'll get into a further discussion about that because you asked us to bring back that discussion. Um, again, the Let them go through their presentation, ask clarifying questions, and then we can open it up to some feedback. Okay, and some more of the feedback we had heard was about the modification of the hardship language, where we have the reasons for requests that parents can check off. We had just hardship written, um, and you asked us to clarify that or provide additional language, and we've made some edits to that as well. And then again, you wanted us to further clarify about how we will communicate with families with regards to any transportation or um, any other uh, language that needs to be brought out to parents to make them aware of these changes so they are comfortable with that. Right. So here again, um, this is again just talking about the prioritization of that. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So here, this is the breakdown of how we prioritize early college over magnet over year round. So we have them in different levels, level 1A being early colleges, 1B magnets, and 1C year round. Okay, 1A are early colleges, and so basically how this says is if you apply to an early college and you apply to a magnet, if you get seated at your early college, we will not process your magnet application. Okay, if you do not get seated for your early college, and you get placed in an applicant pool, which is formerly a wait list, we will continue to process your magnet application. Okay? If you get seated from the applicant pool for your early college, we will then take away your magnet seat if you were seated. Or if you were in the applicant pool as well for the magnet, you will then be removed from the, the applicant pool for magnet. So you see how we have that hierarchy where it's early colleges, and then if you get that seat or if you are waitlisted, we then go to your next step, give you that seat or waitlist, and then go down to the third step. But always, if you get seated from the waitlist at the higher level, we will remove you from the lower waitlist. I think there were some, there have been a number of questions about this, and so we've got, um, um, Tamani is here to explain some of it as well, should we have questions in terms of why they are prioritized that way, so. I think Dr. Martin is cash up clarifying questions. Well, I understand the how works. I don't understand the why, or maybe I do understand the why, but I'm not sure I agree with the why. Uh, it's probably more likely the case, and I think it would be, well, I know there are families who are going to apply to multiple ones, but a magnet might be preferential, might be their choice over an early college. So do we create an, a, a barrier to either or both that we don't need to have because the family is going to say, well, you know, I'd be interested in early college if I can't get in a magnet, but I'd like a magnet over an early college. But because of this, 
I'm not even going to apply to the early college. So I personally would like to see us get to a point where parents could define priority rather than we define priority. That's so I think, and I think, I think we've we've talked about that. I think that's the, it's how you actually implement that in the algorithm, etc. That <coughs> becomes a bit of a problem. Um, I, I can tell you that in terms of why they are the way they are now, and, and I'll let anyone jump in. The fewest seats we have available are at early colleges. Those average 55 students in an entering grade level. And there are defined parameters and an application process that goes along with that. Um, and some of the parameters include a minimum of 50% of the students being first generation college students, because that's how, that's how we get the um, cooperative innovative um, grants to prioritize uh, first time college going students. So front loading those helps us ensure that we can review those, eyeball them, the applications, and ensure that the students are distributed, 55 of them per school, um, based on the priorities that have been identified. Um, and then the magnets come after that. Much There are many more seats available in magnets than there are in the early colleges. Some schools have, du you know, we have schools with duplicate programs across the county. Um, but they are, but they are also, they also have priorities aligned with them in terms of um, who gets priority points for different areas. And then we are proposing the year rounds coming after that uh, because we have more year round seats, well, maybe not about more year round seats than we have magnets, depending on the, the grade level. And, uh, and this is new for us here. So we're putting uh, year rounds as a third option. Not many families will apply for all three for sure. Some may apply for the first two, but that's only um, sixth grade through ninth grade for the two leadership academies, and the rest of it is just high schools. Um, but other than that, it's just middle and high schools that you find that issue with, with 1A and 1B. And then if there's anything that I left out. And first generation students have a higher priority at the early colleges, and that's the target audience. And so that's why we're able to capture as many as possible by prioritizing that first, the early college. So Glenn, talk to them about this split of seats. So when you talk about 55 seats, you're really only eligible for any one of 25 because the seats are just split. Yeah, they're split between first gen, which we seat first, and then non first gen applicants. So it's far fewer seats. Good clarification. Ms. Cash, did you, did you have a question as well? Um, this is where our the system, this is where we can help our system the most if we can figure out the logistics because also the parent might want one over the other, but as a system, we might want to. We want to fill all of these. So if somebody has a year round they want to go to and we have a waiting list for a magnet that they put down, I would prefer to put them in the year round and give the magnet to a waiting list because this is where we can use our system to fill all of these seats. Logistics is hard, but it's still important for us to look at. And, and I think with the magnets having a program pathway, um, you're more likely to have students that don't get seated because of the different um, priorities that we use, whereas the early colleges don't have that benefit of a program pathway. So it's a little bit more difficult for them to get all of the, the applicants that a magnet would. But if you had like 70 people that wanted to get into the early college and of those they wanted magnet too, we could use them in the magnet and still fill up our early applications and fill our magnets too. The program pathway is not particularly relevant for the early colleges because you either have the 6 through 12 of the leadership academies or you just have high school, therefore you don't have a program pathway. I think we were just talking about magnets with program pathway. Yeah. Okay. The early colleges so, don't have one. Right. But So that's not even part so of the conversation. one of the things this allows is a family who, let's say I'm at Carnage with magnet status. This allows a Carnage student to apply for an early college, and if not, <coughs> thank you for coming. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Easier on the mic. <laughs> okay, this allows a family who has magnet status. Let's say you're at Carnage and you have priority to Enlo because you're a magnet student at a GT school. You apply to Enlo. This actually helps those families. You can apply for an early college without losing your magnet priority. So you could apply for an early college if you're not selected, 
then your magnet application would run with your magnet priorities. You're still on your early college wait list, so should you, should a seat open, you could be called for an early college, but you've still got your magnet placed, so you don't lose anything. I'm afraid that if you put magnet before early college, your early college is going to fill up because you're really only buying for 25 to, I don't know, 35, 40 seats, because either you're first gen or you're not. So I'm afraid your early college is going to fill up if you put early college second. If you put your magnet first, I don't think you'll have an opportunity to even be considered for your early college because it's going to fill up because it's got so few seats. So that's kind of why we align them this way, is fill up the fewest seats first, put those students there, then run everybody else. So I guess I'm suggesting that the parent needs to be able to I mean, I understand that, right? right? That, that is a priority if that is your choice. That's true. Right? If that is not your choice, then, that, then we're imposing that priority on you. Right. That's, that's what my concern is. I know what you're saying. So we, and that, that has less to do with the kids who are in a magnet where there is program priority than there are kids from other uh, settings who are wanting to apply in. So if I'm to, in my district uh, at Westlake Middle School and I want to apply to, do I want to go to Enlo or do I want to go to the uh, Leadership Academy or NC STEM, right? Um, now what do I do? If my really Enlo is my top choice, do I not even apply? to the leadership academies or the NC STEM because if I do, or the weight STEM, because if I do, then I don't have my first choice. You see what I'm saying? What we've done is we artificially bias the choice to the leadership academies, which is gonna be fine for some people. But but I think that should be a parent choice. I don't think I, that should I be. I think we're, we're artificially choice. biasing the choices to the district's advantage. Um, and I understand how you want to give parents more choice in that, but that that doesn't help the district. It's helping the parent, but it doesn't help. Every time you open the door to more choice for the parent, it's not always helping the district. And we haven't really said this, that we're not really sure programmatically it's even possible. Because we run our selection programmatically, electronically, that it's even possible. Uh, we actually have different vendors that do different parts of our selection process. It's not all one vendor that does it all. Okay. I think we've looked into this, but, and, and I think what part of what Laura is explaining is that because, again, of the limited number of seats that are available at our early college application schools, because half of those seats go away when you're looking at priorities that are yes or no, that the number of students you're talking about is 25 for our five or six application schools. For each one of them. 25 each, so that's um, 300 kids that, that are gonna get into application schools and the rest would go into the next priority that they, the next, the other, the magnet would be the next option. So you're not disenfranchising lots of families when they choose to go, when they choose to put both an early college application school and a magnet school in the same application. I mean, we receive thousands of applications for magnet schools, but the most that we can see at early colleges that are non-first generation college students is about 300. On a, diff on a different note, so say if you had 100 applications to Ligon Middle School, and of those 100, 50 of them put a second choice of Durant Road Middle. If you put, in, put the first 50 in there, you're going to lose these Durant Middle. So you want to seat your Durant Middle first and still give the 50 seats to the 50 left over for Ligon. Therefore, you seated 100 magnets. Well, you've got to look at the priorities yeah. that they bring different priorities for each of those for a magnet but is a different you, set of if priorities. If you put one of those students that meet both priorities immediately into the magnet, you're going to lose them for the, you, you won't have them to put into the year round. Process that. I was just trying to get as many people into the seats that say I would like either or that fit our criteria 
we don't lose any applicants by giving them what we think is the priority in this tier. You know what I mean? I guess her point is to Ms. Evans, what's optimizing the district being able to utilize their seats the most efficiently? Well, that's what I, that's yes. why I was thinking that we don't want to lose any that might need it in capacity just because we gave them the magnet first. When we had another student that wanted the magnet but didn't even give us the option of a year-round still met the district needs. Again, it's a logistical thing that you have to weigh for those that choose more than one. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Now, I will say that's a fear that I hear from parents, and so far I've always been able to squash the fear. Their fear is always, if I put two, will you just give me what you want me to have? Well, well actually, well, my son doesn't do it, the program, but the program, I've been able to assure them, does not do it. The program does not just give them what we want them to have, but it runs in a certain algorithm. So, well, actually, I was hoping we would give them what we wanted them to have. <laughs> so, because for our system's benefit, we do right. want to give them, because they're willing to ease it. So I'm not so much looking at the fear of the parent because they're kind of willing to go either way. I want to use that application for what's best for us. So I think that's why we've looked at putting, doing magnet first to fill up our magnet. Historically, year round when we marketed for them years ago, we're very popular. They, they, they were. Large we didn't have this trouble. Right. And so we seeded our magnets first. Similarly to why we see early college first. It was advantageous to us to fill our magnet seats first because we had lots of people exactly. who wanted year round. So, um, and and I, that's why my argument's so, different right, now because right, right. now we need the seats. So. so I think it may be, I think I, I get where you're going with all of this, but I, I think it also may be important for us to see how this works because, I mean, we're going to review this every year. Um, and, and I think we'll see how it works <laughs> once we implement. And we may then have the data from which we need to say, this is how many didn't, this is how many asked, this is how many asked for both. And if we'd had an opportunity to prioritize, maybe we could have done this. But I, but I and, think we need the data. And you know what? That, not to interrupt, but that, if we do it one year like this, but we have the opportunity to be able to look and go back and see how many I think we possibilities we yes. missed of seating kids to help our system. I think, and I think that would be a way to really see how, how many people choose to and where we work at cross purposes. Exactly. And each of these columns has different priorities for Correct. Yeah. That's what I was going to mention, that it might be more difficult to just choose early college has this algorithm it follows, Magnet has a different algorithm, Uran has a different one, and I'm not a programmer so I can't speak, but I would think it would be difficult to run them together with such different priorities. Each priority serves a different purpose for those schools. This should not be a that difficult to program in general. I'm seeing a fourth one that goes across all three mm -hmm. and pulls and out qualifying. I think we used to. So you're in multiple lists. There used mm -hmm. to be a way that, unless it was done. If you're on multiple but lists, then, 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 yeah. yeah. And if you have a sibling? Yeah. And that if you have a sibling as a magnet priority. student somewhere, does that influence the selection? That's that might be the magnet algorithm. algorithm. That is an interesting it's thought. It's hard to stop the way you're good. <laughs> 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 if they apply. <laughs> 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 There'll be a business case associated with that. <laughs> 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 yeah. I want to clarify so I understand what Ms. Cash said. If I apply as my number one choice as a year round. You don't have a choice. You don't get to list which choice you So you don't? Okay, so. Tell me that again. That's what we're talking about. Okay, so if I apply, I'm going. You may apply to a magnet in the mag on the magnet page. Imagine three pages. Okay. So you can apply on the early college page, or don't do that one. You can go to the magnet page, list first, second, third. Then you can go to a year-round page and list. And, and you apply. Get one choice on your round. It's on your address. Okay. Right. So if I'm willing to accept nothing but a year-round school, that is all I want. That's all you just That's, that's all you want. All I, and you will not try to fill up a magnet Correct. or anybody else. Correct. Then only apply for year-round. Year round. Don't apply for any of the others. You don't have to. Correct. But if I say, okay, I'm worried I might not get that year-round, so I'm going to, and I'd be okay with the magnet. I can put my name on both lists, and the algorithm is going to run based on all the priorities. It'll run all of your magnets first. Right. And then if you're selected for a magnet, you'll be assigned to that magnet, say. and it won't run your year-round. Well, you get the year-round because it's going to throw you in the magnet. 
Yeah. Might be your second it choice. Magnet. Magnet might be a second choice, but you can't get your round because you get a magnet. And it might be not what's best for us. Yeah, I get it now. So um, that's what we're trying. That's what we're saying. I think it it would be helpful to run it and see, or look at look at what the options are for another algorithm. Well, if this is the the format that we're going to use, then it just emphasizes more and more. We have to do a great job of marketing marketing our year-round schools so that those who really want year-round, we get more people who really want that and apply, and that's all they apply for. Which is the way we ran it before you were, as someone was asking historically, yeah. the way we ran it before was we yes. did magnets first and we did year-round second. Year-rounds were so popular. They, just, it, they were. They were on the same. And they were on the same. It was still, still a, it was still a two-page kind of thing. You clicked a link. I either want both. I want one. I want the others. And as part of our marketing, it has to be crystal. It, it will be crystal clear to us. But we need to do everything we can to make it understandable um, to our families that if you want a year-round, apply for a year-round. So far, year-round, we've already given year-round a couple of dates to have open houses. Okay. Um, and there will be a year-round booth or a table, not a booth, table at the Magnet Fair. Um, and there are year-round principals who will be staffing that at the Magnet Fair. So that's how far we've gotten so far with just kind of our general, including them in our... And would you, if you could, include some parents who are currently in? Yeah, we could uh, because we have heard <laughs> I'll need loud and clear <laughs> from some parents that are more than willing to help market because mm -hmm. they see <laughs> such advantages for their families. Sure. Okay. Um, it's, it's, I have a couple of principals that I'm working with that are in charge of their booth for the Magnet Fair, so okay. I'll mention that to them. I'm just wondering from a, a logistics standpoint, um, as far as I go to apply, do I have to go, and I know early college is different because there is that application process, right. but if I'm looking at Magnet and Year Round, do I have to go to two different websites to apply, or is that all in that, all that on portal? The same screen. And then, or if I want year round, I can just say no thanks to Magnet, and then it'll just take me to the year round page. Is that what we're looking so your for? Your drop downs will be on one screen, imagine mm -hmm. like a T, T chart. Yeah. On the left hand side, you'll have your Magnet selections that you can make, and on the right hand side of the screen, you'll have your year round schools that you can select. Okay. I'm just, again, trying to make it from the, the user perspective, streamline and, and make sure that we are um, communicating to parents even when we get to that last piece. <clears throat> things like, if you get assigned a magnet, you will not be able to go back to your base. That's your assignment for next year, as we well, currently have. They will and have sure an opportunity to go back to their base during the request for transfer period. Right. Okay. <clears throat> In a subsequent year. Yeah. And, and they also have opportunity to take themselves off of a wait list. Right. They do have the opportunity you know, to take them off yes. the wait yes. list. If they're sitting on a wait list before we even process the wait list, we send an email to everyone who's on a wait list saying, do you still want to be on this wait list? We're about to fill some available seats. If you don't want to be on the wait list, remove yourself by this date. So they have that chance to. Clarify the timing of these activities. <clears throat> the early college, which 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 the early college application, which involves uh, eyeballs and a review, uh, occurs when compared to the magnet app and the year-round app. So it starts the Monday after the magnet fair. So it's I think, like so November early, so mid-November. Six, yeah. No, it's early November. Okay. For the, for the early college. So that application window is open until about early December. Okay. And then Magnet. That window closes. That window closes to magnet. 10 new applications, yes. And the Magnet application period opens? January, middle of January. Okay. And decisions for, uh, is there a different decision date for the two types of applications? Both results will post on February 14th. Okay. And the year-round application period opens the same time as the current magnet. with the magnet. Yep. Results are posted on the 14th. So yep. for all three of those, February 14th, parents get their notification. Okay, and um, I just got a job that requires my family to go to someplace for nine weeks in the summer. 
and I applied for year round because I thought it would work. But on January, on February 14, what option do I have to make any change? The request for transfer period. At that time, okay. Second. So even new, Not newly yet. selected magnet students or year round students have the option to request a change at that time. Yeah. Okay. And for the same family, that same situation, if that happened in May, they would be able to go into the request for transfer module and submit a transfer request due to a hardship at that point. Okay. Well, let's, if we just talk about Next any other time, row. it's any other time. Not, uh, you know, not. I'm sorry, that picked the wrong month. It's it's right after the notification about magnet and early college and year round. Then we open up the which used to be the May transfer period. We open up the transfer period. Okay, and at that time, they could request their base school if circumstances have changed, if they applied to an early college and got in, but everything's changed now, or if they applied for year-round, like, oh, wait a minute, it's not going to work, then they could request their base school or transfer to okay. any other school. So, so not met. It, it's no, not, no, it's no, not an opt-in. Yeah. Unless they move. It's not an opt-in situation. They are in because they made the application. Yes. They, select. Yes. they have an opt-out that's called a transfer yes. to somewhere. Yes. Probably back to base. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. And I want to go back to that we talked about this before that when you when they accept, I'm going to go to an early college that there is an additional pop up that lets them know that you are accepting it. This is not a change. You you can't accept it on this another. You know the same pop up that when you're about to sign your life away. And well, it pops up. It actually, and says, in their in their letter that they received, yeah. that where they were selected for the seat, it tells them this is your assignment for the 18-19 school year. It also gives them information about the transfer period. Okay, but basically, this is your assignment. So and don't they go online to assign it so to the, agree to it? They, they send in a hard copy to it. That happens. That happens when they apply. When they apply, so they, they, they don't need to accept and deny like they used correct, to. Correct. Don't no. beat me up when I ask that question. <laughs> That's correct. Why don't we do an accept and deny? It used to be an accept and deny. I'm sorry yeah, you but said that it worked, but I just... a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, it was, and it did work, but I mean, now you just can't, you don't have the well, it, car to do it, right? But you but you can, because the very next round you can ask for. Right. But it's a process. It's it's a process. process. But you can ask That's, for it. Yeah. I think it's a process. Yeah, right. It's not accept to deny. So when she said acceptance, there is no acceptance. No. There's no so on acceptance. February 14th, you get into your assignment assignment on those three no. applications. Yeah. And if your circumstances have changed, you're and there's a period right after that that you can request back to base, or you can request um, a transfer somewhere else right in March, right after that. So the back back to base <laughs> request changes from earlier to after the selection. That's a big change. So tell us about that. That is big. Well, um, Next slide. It, it, it's, no. it's a big change somewhat. We had an early transfer, and if you ask for your base during the early transfer, it was here. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. During the previous May transfer period, if you ask for your base, it's not guaranteed. Okay. But now, we're, put, we're combining all those into that late February, early March application period, if you ask for your base, it's going to be guaranteed. Remember, the goal is to get everybody where they want to be right. so that the schools can then plan. Okay, mm -hmm. and if you want your base and you're asking for it at the right time, we're happy to give you your base school. Yeah. So after February 14th opens this request for school transfer. Mm -hmm. Right, that's the next page, so we'll pick up there. Okay, so the last time we had showed this to you, we had talked about how the four original reasons for from the early transfer module that were guaranteed reasons, those will still remain in this application. These would be the reasons that they would check off that they're asking for this transfer, just as they did previously. And then we had a language change here where we had re uh, previously had just hardship request, and we've added some language to say change of school or hardship request to signify that staff needs to review these each and every one individually before making a decision. The other four up at the top will be automatically run through the selection process. If they qualify, they'll be automatically seated. This was an attempt to, to sort of separate that a change of school request had to be predicated upon a defined hardship. Because I think that was feedback that we got that we wanted to separate those a bit. Um, so if they're the similar, it's a similar process, but we wanted to expand the language. 
So this applies, just to be clear, this applies if you, to all the, the uh, students that were accepted in one of the specialty programs, right? And to all the other students. It's like, they could. Right, that they all, at this time, then they get, they're on the same page. And this is your assignment, whether it was the assignment that was going to be coming to you anyway, or it was the assignment you got through going through and trying to be in the year-round schools, magnet school, um, or early college. Okay. At this okay. point, all students will have an assignment for the following school year, whether it came through an application process or it's their base assignment. Got it. Okay. And then this is a period of time where they can make a change, gotcha. request a change. One quick one. Yes, Ms. Cash. Entering grade of a sibling, uh, their sibling that's already in that school only has to be there that one year. That it, somewhere I saw in policy it said the year and the year following, but that's not. Like if you have a seventh grader and you, if you have an eighth grader and you have a rising sixth grader, they're in the school together. So when, when they are requesting a transfer or in an application, there is a priority around an entering grade sibling. Um, okay. That's still there. Entering grade. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily seventh grade or right. yeah. anything. That's grade language we may want to discuss. Right. Yeah. In 4150. There was that's coming up there. Right. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Because to, to say join a sibling entering grade or grandfathering, those are in part two different things. Yes, they are. Yeah. That's yes, they are. Okay. All right, so just to recap, again, we talked about the previous four uh, reasons would be the automatic selections, again, the carryovers from the early transfer period. And then whenever they identify the change of school or hardship request, staff would need to read through those individually before determining a result. Um, just a reminder, though, that all denied requests submitted during this period uh, would be eligible for an appeal to the board. Um, this would also include parents for families that experience a change of address after that window has closed, as well as any families that moved here uh, after that window was open. Ms. Matthews. So I, hypothetical, I'm, I'm based in a year-round school. Year-round doesn't work for my family. The only way I can transfer to a traditional calendar is through a hardship request. Or, or change of or school. Change of school. Change it of would school. be the same. It's a change of school, change not a hardship. School. Okay. Yeah. So that's why we expanded that language. Right. And, and I don't know if we don't need change to just change school. the hardship okay. language completely, but it's change of school or a hardship transfer. Okay. It's basically a transfer request under the statutory factors that you guys do all the time. Um, it, 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 all students are entitled to make that request, and it's the, the main statutory factors of best interest of the child as well as the interest of the school district that are balanced, and you make the decisions. And you guys have tended to call it hardship, and now you're expanding it to that, but it's basically a transfer under the statutory factors. I just wanted to, to bring that out and, and see. I'm, I'm glad that that was put there, and I like having the change of school or hardship language there. And that timing's similar in some ways because it's right after the magnet. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so these are some of the types of things that we're talking about when we're talking about change of school or hardship. And I, I also just want to thank you for putting the hardship request period or earlier because I know that it is a long wait until May and to get to reapply for a hardship and to get those results and, and and have those through the process. It's it's a long ask and a lot of a lot of change. So I think having that sooner is I think that's a, a positive change, having that sooner rather than having it in May. <coughs> so thank you. That's a positive change. My only concern is the express transportation bus schedules that come out really close to when school starts and sometimes they're so far away at such a weird time that parents can't get there or the child has to wait for an hour. We don't have any way for them to address that, do we? Because oh. that express stop is my my biggest concern because they right. come out pretty close to the day the school starts and some of them are... Let's look at the change. Yeah, so, so I mean there's, there, is, there are conversations happening <laughs> around how how we if there are ways to expedite that if we know who the students are sooner. So but so those conversations are there's an acknowledgement that the sooner the better there. I think moving this from May 
Correct. earlier is not just good for parents, it's going to be good for the system for these reasons right. in addition. You have to take the learning hurdle. Right. And take a lot of communication to, for folks to know, wow, this is a big change. Okay. Dr. Marcus. I agree. But I want to reinforce Ubrox's issue about the express stop. That's not addressed here. Now, I appreciate the change of the language, the change of school or hardship, but I, I would like to request that we must show hardship the last bullet under traditional calendar. I think that needs to be struck because that just, that's what initiated this conversation in the first. I understand. Okay. Yes. Change of school. And I've already asked to okay. just add statutory factors into there as well, just so that we know. Thank, thank you. Good catch. Yep. And I think it shows parents that we're listening if we do ask for them to, to share their reasons why, but I don't, um, you know, if, if we have room in a in a traditional calendar school, you know, they don't necessarily need to show hardship if we have a seat. You don't in your area. Well, I think that's where there's a, uh, I think where the drop down we'll box do. where we'll ask them to explain their requests will be helpful. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it seems like we're listening. Correct. And we're not just message repeated. Well, I think we want to emphasize the explain the request, right? Because we're yeah. going to have to make a decision. Not everybody who makes the request can we grant. And so we will clearly prioritize based on the, the explained reasons, right? So, so you can't, if somebody just says, I want it, chances that that happens are, are low. Is the um, child care um, and the addition of elementary after child care new? That we've got that in the suggested writing in the policy. So it'll, come you did. Okay. it'll come back right. up in the policy and yeah. discussion because we get a lot of middle schools and and we and um, and we will get that, that, we will get to that. It's going to bleed, I think, in from the, from this one. <laughs> so. All right. So again, just we will continue. Um, we'll we'll continue to practice of not applying the automatic guarantee when they just make a request for the the old calendar option schools, so the schools that are designated for their address. We have not been guaranteeing those and will continue to not guarantee those. We will look at the reasoning. Um, there's no anticipated changes to the designated schools for the address. So when you go to the address lookup for your address, you will still see the same schools that you can apply to listed there. We're not looking to change any schools for any addresses. Unless we bring you something in the enrollment, enrollment plan. plan. You know, yeah. that has to do with opening the new school. So Does that include a, a calendar option for a traditional school? It includes a choice for a traditional school. We don't have calendar options anymore. Okay. Okay, so I envision we're still working this out, that right now when you go on the website, you put your address in, you see your base schools, and then you see a button for application schools. When you click that button, you see calendar options and magnets, okay? That's going to change. You're gonna see a button for your base schools, and you're gonna see a button for your application schools, and under that application button will be listed all the magnet schools, all the early colleges, and if you're base traditional, you'll see a year-round choice, if you're base year-round, you'll see it, a traditional choice. And then the traditional choice, it'll have some additional information that you apply through the February transfer period or something like that. And it's a separate okay. process. Yes. Yeah. Okay. For each one of those things, it'll tell you when to apply. Sure. Okay. Thank you. And again, the transportation that we provide for each of these choices will not change. And that will all be noted on the address lookup as well as it is now. And we're going to have wait lists for early college magnet and year-round. So you can have some year-round folks moving, requesting and receiving traditional calendar choice in a second round. So we got to make sure we're filling a lot of our seats. Dr. Martin. Are we certain that we will have no transportation changes? I mean, I think we, we're still talking about wanting to incentivize going to year-round. And so the calendar option, I think we want to go ahead and incentivize that transportation, but I'm not sure we, ne we necessarily want to incentivize year-round back to traditional. I think we want to make that option possible where we can, but do we do we guarantee transportation of that? We have tradition. We, we have with the calendar option. We have been guaranteeing transportation, but 
But, but we've often talked about that the, the, the calendar option transportation has given us a, an extra transportation ulcer. Mm -hmm. So do we not want to use transportation to incentivize what we need to incentivize, which right now is filling our year-round schools? I'm not sure we need to transportation incentivize year-round back to traditional. Can you talk about that? That's a good question. That's a good question. So, so I guess I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to say that there will be no transportation changes. Right. In its in its implementation, what that would look like is some version of the March change of school request from multi-track year round to traditional to be processed in the same manner as some of the other transfer requests are being processed, where the transportation is parent provide. But that's a board decision. Yes. And it, it, additionally, if you make that decision, you've got a number of students who are at their what we call traditional calendar option today receiving transportation. Right. Existing. So you would have to talk through. You might need a grandfather or something. Like that. What you would do with those, right? Right. If they're not back to base, by another discussion we have. Right. All right. See, it's back a lot of layers that shouldn't on. be an issue. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. If we're going to get to policy, we need to uh, keep going. <laughs> right. So these, this is the additional communication that we plan to have in the application. We will have alerts for parents so that they can acknowledge that either their transportation will or will not be provided based on the selection that they're making, as well as um, Transportation. Oh, and the crowding concerns that they are acknowledging that they are applying to a school that is closed for transfers. <laughs> closed for transfers. <laughs> so we're just making sure that parents understand, you know, hey, this is the information that you are going up against when you make this selection. If I'm in a year-round school and I want to transfer to a traditional school, but it's capped, is it still going to be listed there? I, it will be closed. I don't know. So I mean, it'll be on the closed list. Yeah. So it would, if it wasn't capped, it would. Well, it closed just it doesn't de designate it, capped only. Okay. Closed would be overcrowded schools that we designate as closed. Closed to transfers. Closed, closed them to transfers because their crowding percentage is high enough that we okay. want to make sure that we're allowing space for base and not non base. Yes, yeah, so they know that this is, don't even apply for the transfer because well, there we is no it. room. We, don't, we don't prohibit, we don't prohibit the transfer request. We just need to make it abundantly clear that they're requesting something that can't be granted. <laughs> Highly well, then well, you have then you have the text box that allows them to explain why you should. I don't know why. And is that notification going to be made before that first round for parents who may want to be interested in a early college magnet? It's a part. It'll be part of the application. So that the, the so that the parent will know when they look at their choices. Yes. Yes. What, yes. That yes. they're all what what's available and what's not. Yes, it'll be okay. part of the, okay. the website and the information yeah, about all the schools, okay. and then we hit it again as a part of the application process, where the windows will pop up on there. We have a complicated. All right. So we'll be so we're gonna we'll look at. There's one little piece that I want to go back and take a look at that okay. I'm just gonna reserve talking about out loud for right now that I do want to take a look at. But generally speaking, um, these are the, the changes and the ones that you want us to bring back for discussion for us to begin to implement with the application process. It, there's one little piece that I do want to take a look at again and see what the numbers show in terms of what our magnet applications look like in terms of seats there and what our year-round seats look like. And then I'll, I, may, I may have an update. But, but okay. right now, I want to take a look at that first. Thanks. Okay. And so we'll see this again in the next meeting, September. When we get well, well, you'll see some aspects of this in the enrollment plan. On September They'll be threaded 19. through the enrollment plan, which will be at the next meeting. Dr. Martin, Ms. Well, I guess I'm curious. We had discussion about the priority listing, but I don't know that we ever made a decision. Are we just saying we're going to run it this year and look at where there are multiple options of priority? Where, where did we land on that? I'm not, I personally am not I don't know if we comfortable. Land. I don't think that. So I, I don't know where to land. But what, I, I what I thought I heard, we did not do any thumbs up or anything, but what I heard from Tamani's explanation was that there are discrete 
periods of application, the, the challenge is there's a single notification date. Okay. Single notification date should make the priority easier, I think. Well, the, 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 the college application has to be in first. The application okay. has to be in, but right. that doesn't mean the decision has been made. Right. I, I'm just, maybe I shouldn't try to recap. Because the, <laughs> the, 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 the challenge is the decision date, the publication of the decision is a single date. That to me seems to be the challenge, that they're not two different dates that will give the parent the opportunity to say, well, I didn't get into the early college, now I'll, get, I'll go to the magnet app. So I'm not so suggesting I'm, it should be an after the fact decision, I'm suggesting it should be a different process. And, and I think I would agree that it is, a, it is better for the system for it not to be, because we, we must fill those 300 seats with kids who are um, uh, first college attenders. And we have another 300 seats for the rest of the county. Even if a magnet school would be a better place for the first uh, year college attender. We, we have an obligation to fill half of those seats with first year college attenders. If we don't do that, then we have other problems. She's going to come up with a solution. She's going to come up with a solution. So my, my request would be that um, staff run as we have explained it for this year and get data on it unless I change my mind <laughs> after I go pull some numbers and, and, and figure out what actually benefits us most and what order those dominoes should fall in. But there's still, what I am saying is that there's an order in which the dominoes will fall. I, we are not prepared, I think at this point, and with money or time to implement either a fourth process that, that allows parents to prioritize or have multiple options and those dominoes fall differently. That's not to say we can't bring that forward in a year, but we don't have it right now. Um, so what I'm asking is I need a way for the dominoes to fall, first, second, third priority, without parents having necessarily chosen a priority. And I want it to work for both parents and the district in terms of what our numbers show. Right now, our best guess is what you see with early colleges, Magnus, and year round. I need to dig a little to see if a different domino falling order would make sense. If that does, if a different order makes sense, I'll let you know. And then we'll run it based on those dominoes falling this year, but we will look at what the data shows to determine either a fourth option, a fourth algorithm, a multiple choice option, one where parents get to choose in what order they want the dominoes to fall. We'll look at that, but we just, yes. that's a lot to do Thank right now. Yes. And at the end of the day, the, the parent still is going to apply for the programs they choose for their child. They may need to prioritize preemptively. Yes. what I would say. Right. And that is what this and process your does. your top choice is a magnet, and that's what you want for your student, you should put that and apply only for that. And we and need to be clear that you apply only for that. You apply only. only. And no where is clear, we just need to be very clear where the priorities are so that parents do make informed choices. But at right. the end of the day, they do have the choice to what they apply for their students. Limited choice. Limited. I mean, it might limited be choice. preemptively well, limited, be but um, some just way won't stay at their their base. No, I think you often say that. Yeah. That's why I was just trying to give a lot of choice, but it's, yeah. it's really a limited. Uh, do we know what the percent capacity you're hitting in the early college for these first term college and the others? Yeah, typically we're able to hit 50-50. We so, so you're filling. You're at 100 percent. Yes. Right. So we, and, and if we could go over 50 first time college goers, we would. Yeah. Um, we, I mean, we'll, that's the priority for the Cooperative Innovative High School program is first time college going students. Um, a lot of the co those programs in the state of North Carolina are looking for a 75 to 80 percent first time college goers. It's just really hard for us to hit that in this part of the county. So we shoot for 50 and go higher where we can. And I think the challenge for these schools is there's not a um, on ramp subsequently if we have attrition. I think that's where we're seeing some of our capacity challenges. Um, so I'd love for us to think about 
for the more than 50, but that's, I won't put that on the table right now. <laughs> All right. It, it'd be interesting, too, if the legal side of trying to avoid as many transfer appeals as you get yes. to see whether um, if, if down the road you are able to prioritize in a way that's um, for the uh, specialty programs. Um, that uh, that you would get less transfer appeals after right. that, right? right? So that if, if everybody sort right. of got, but yeah. I know you, you got to do it for the district, right. and I get that. But if everybody sort of got their first choice, then maybe you wouldn't have those transfer appeals afterwards. Well, that was Ms. Evans' point. Get the students where they want to be. So. Until the girlfriend doesn't get accepted. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll leave that. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. And thank you. It's well, real. It's it real. is a good segue straight to our yeah. final <laughs> item on uh, policy. You know. Dr. Martin kind of. I don't run see a plan. So today we're <laughs> on this policy. There's some work that's going to be done in student achievement. I understand on this policy. Um, perhaps also at our retreat and facilities, but today you guys want us to look at the transfer piece of the policy, correct? So we, um, I'll let Dr. Martin sort of recap where we ended up from policy committee in just a minute, but what, we're, what we'll be doing really is just continuing the work that we started at policy committee in 4150. Um, we had a lot of conversation that happened during policy committee that really started veering off into implementation of policy and, and how policy is uh, implemented. And, and I just wanted to remind board members that the implementation of 4150 is generally the annual enrollment plan. It's the enrollment plan. So when you see in the enrollment plan how we are making decisions about grandfathering or what schools are going to be capped and what stability looks like, it's why those factors are all over the enrollment plan. Um, so in some cases, you know, we want to keep that language in the policy at a high level, and you'll see the nuts and bolts of implementation and enrollment plan. But there was clearly a desire for the board to discuss some of those nuts and bolts around implementation, whether it was philosophy or the logistics of implementation. And, and that was the information that I sent out a while ago, and, and that had to do with questions about the student achievement pillar and the question that came up at the end of policy committee about targets and, and that sort of thing, or what the stability pillar looks like, and in particular how grandfathering is applied to that. Um, there were also questions about process and language around application schools, which we did some work on that in the policy already. And then we started going into transfer appeals and requests for transfers. Uh, so 4150, broad overview, there were not a lot of changes. Um, in, in, if you see what's in blue. Uh, but it was clear as we went through it that there was desire for the board to continue conversation on certain aspects of implementation of that policy. So what we talked about was that there's a number of board meetings coming up right in a row next week with student achievement on September 11th, the board retreat on September 12th, and then facilities committee on the 13th. <laughs> and to what extent possible and made sense that we could fit some of these discussions into those time slots um, while continuing our work through policy here with the, the overarching language, uh, knowing that those discussions were coming um, in the next week or so. And then depending on where we land after those discussions and after our discussion today, we're either ready to recommend the policy on September 19th or we are wait, or we will need to go maybe revisit it again at September policy committee and go to first board meeting in October. That, that's kind of how that'll fall out. And then, um, and then I'll let it. I'll leave it to Dr. Martin to sort of recap where we are. Okay, so I'll try to do a quick recap, and then we've got just kind of 15 to 20 minutes ish, which is, I don't know that we're going to get a lot more accomplished. But I think maybe there, maybe we can have one conversation related to what we've just been talking about to a degree. So I think where we are from policy committee, and uh, I think everybody was there, just to recap is I. I think we got through the language of the pillars. Um, uh, we have added the, to the extent practicable in each of the pillar language, and that comes at the recommendation uh, of council, because again, all of these are going to do the best we can. Uh, there's very little we can guarantee in the fast-growing system. Uh, significant changes that we made in policy committee meeting was that we took away a lot of the lists. So, for example, under student <coughs> achievement, uh, point one, uh, 
we just said providing the opportunity for families to apply to designated application schools, period, and took out that list. We did that a couple, one other place. Uh, I think that clarified things. So I, um, we, for the stability, we did not change that much. We uh, did put in language about um, change of domicile does not uh, um, constitute a stability issue that we're trying to guarantee. Although in the parking lot that we still have to reserve, that we still have to address, is what does change of domicile look like for our application schools? I think the issue particularly on the, on the docket is what do we do for the year-round request? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the magnet and the early colleges, I think the implication is that, that change of domicile will continue. It becomes a little bit more complex, which we'll have to work on for the year-round because your year-round is to the year-round associated with your base. Magnet are largely are countywide, not completely, but largely are countywide. So we're going to have to resolve that. I don't know that we want to try to resolve that in well, in pol whether it's in policy or whether we resolve that today. Right. I guess maybe we could come today with the decision of is that a ve well, I guess two things. One. Do we want to keep the, if you change domicile, do magnet and early college assignments stay? I think so. Kind of thumbs up thumbs on up that on one? Thumbs up on that. Keep it. Okay. Yeah. So then now, the, the, so the, keep the, it the same. Keep it as we currently do. Yeah. So while we don't think we can solve the problem today, I think we need to give staff either direction to or not to. Do we want to try to develop a, uh, a, a domicile retention, domicile guarantee for year-round? Lindsay. I think um, my the first thoughts that came to my head on this uh, are if you move, mm -hmm. uh, transportation isn't guaranteed if you're not in the transportation zone for that year-round school, but parent-provided transportation perhaps could be an option, or perhaps you get priority to a year-round school that's geographically closer to where you have. Uh, those were the things that kind of with popped in. With transportation. Yes. With well, transportation. I mean, think you overall, you finish out the year, right? We've kind of gotten that for all of our schools. If you I think, want to. Huh? If, if you want, want to. If you want to. Right. Yeah. But, but, but I, think, I think really the question is, in a subsequent year, and, and, and I think you've, you've highlighted the, what mm -hmm. I think I would no, default that toward would is that priority to a year round that is the year round for whatever your base is as opposed to being able to stay, you know, if you're at Durant right. and you move to the West Lake area, you can go to the West Lake one maybe, but not keep going to Durant. So but you're do saying we want they to go to Durant without transportation. Well, and, the, and that's you had a choice the of going to the do one. Do you go to the school that you've been at with if parent can provide transportation? You get that. Or option. do you do you automatically get or do you get priority? Do you, I think it's almost give them two options. Two. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think the the practice we've had is that with the appropriate application. Or request the parent and the child can stay at the school they've been at for the remainder of the current year then they go to the new domicile mm -hmm. to the school serving the new domicile whether it's traditional or year-round I think that's that would be consistent and then they would have transportation either way but they'd that's have an application that we're trying to appeal mm -hmm. to the public and that's so, 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 are we saying layer on top of that bill a prior, like Lindsay said, a priority to an, a, a a calendar? Yeah. Well, let me let me understand what Roxy's saying. I'm a, maybe I don't well, understand I mean, what you're if saying. If we're going to market the schools and want to appeal to the parents, we have to give them some stability. It has to be in the program for sure. And I don't know if we can promise that at a new school in their area. So I, I kind of like what Lindsay was saying, that you give them 
the opportunity of two options where they can stay at the school they're at providing their own transportation or go or have first priority in their school that they're moving towards without or with transportation if there's room. I think they need to be able to stay in the year-round program. As, a, so as an attractant. If I can just okay. throw a couple of thoughts on that. Um, I think that works better if the year-round of your new domicile address has space. Yes. Yeah. Right? Might not. So and we could. your domicile school that you're assigned to is not under enroll. Is yes, because if both it's ways. under enroll, works both ways. But we could, and it depends on what you want to prioritize. Do you want to prioritize the under enrolled school that's the base school having the family? Or do you want to prioritize maintaining the choice you gave the family or not, depending on if they've been in the year-round family, because the year-round needs them more than the under-enrolled school needs them. And that depends on who's crowded and who's not. What could, you know, and I was checking on this, I mean, we could look at the possibility of priority points in the application process. So if you move domiciles and you are now base assigned to a traditional calendar school, but you want to stay in the year-round program, you would apply for the year-round program just like anybody else does that's based assigned to that traditional school, but you would receive a priority point somewhere in the priority list for having come from a previous year-round school that want, and wanted to stay in the year-round program. But if, you, but if you guarantee it, you are guaranteeing it for somebody who just moved into a neighborhood that's not assigned to it over students that might be base assigned or have been in a, a feeder pattern of year round in that area that would have had priority over them that have lived there the whole time. Does that make sense? Yes. And it does make sense, yeah. but if you don't if you don't give stability, if you don't market with stability in mind for the year round program, you're gonna have an uphill battle. So that, that was, that was a key this attracted um, early on document that we got earlier, and of those, uh, I think it was twenty seven schools. There are at least because my count might be off. There are at least seven year-round schools that are on that list. Right. So we can't guarantee that. I mean, if I move, you know, you move into Olive Chapel, you can't be guaranteed to throw somebody out if you got a first grader. Right. And so that's the other piece that we're dealing with where, you know, maybe we do want the parent provide option. You know, if I'm at Banks Road, I'm happy at Banks Road and I move into the, you know, uh, base, but I still want my kids to go there. I, you know, I mean, it, there's so many different moving parts. It's using the multi track for the right reason. It's right. It's right. not right. So so that helps if you need to, if you, if you need to keep at an under-enrolled monthly track, but if you've right. got the over-enrolled monthly track and you move out, mm -hmm. then it doesn't help you. So I guess I'm wondering, do we want to give staff instructions along the line of what uh, Ms. Moore just articulated that even like our, our magnet systems, right, even if there is a, a, a priority path for the magnet, you're not guaranteed <coughs> that, but you have priority points that will take you along that. Do we want to recommend developing a similar structure to the year-round application process where there is a set of priority points. I think the legislation is forcing us to do that. Well, and we've had those priority points because I think a rising sixth grader coming from year-round currently has priority points to get into a year-round middle school. Yes. Yes. So it would be something similar, I'm assuming. Correct. It would be similar that would be like a midstream thing, like in the middle of middle school experience or in the middle of your elementary experience due to a change in domicile where you are now domiciled in a traditional calendar base and you want to maintain your priority, you want, you want a you want priority to, to a year round, then we would build that in as a priority somewhere in the list. And, but priorities, again, only work when there are seats available. Right. So. Well, I'm just, as a parent of a magnet student and a year-round child, a hundred years ago, the fact that I could leave Ligon and move anywhere in the district and my child could go there was a big incentive. But if you had said that to me when I lived, my kids were at Durant, if you move from Durant, you won't necessarily get to go there. I probably would have chose not to go to Durant necessarily. So you're giving the magnets a big, do we want, 
It just depends on how much we want people to buy into the multi-track. I hear it saying we will be giving them some priority to But not a guarantee a like you would at Ligon. Right. Like if you moved and you're in the league, you can go anywhere with it if you're in Ligon, right? And get in to Ligon? No. No. When you're in? No. 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 So, no. So, so, so well, if you're a Ligon so student and you move to another area, you can't stay at Ligon? Uh -huh. Yes, it, it might be pair of provide transportation. Yes, you're correct. You're correct. Yes, if you provide well, transportation. Well, parent provided, which is what she's yeah. saying, which is through the year round. That's what I'm saying. With through the middle school year. But you could stay at Durant. Well, that's what I'm saying. Are you saying if you provide your own transportation, you can move anywhere if you're in a multi -trip? We haven't, we haven't said that. Okay, no. We have not said that. Gotcha. The difficulty in doing that is because we've got <laughs> some multi-tracks that are completely full and others where we need capacity and so that's and, where we and can't I have a guarantee. Called too. And so you could, I mean if I use specific examples, you take your most crowded multi-track year round middle school in the district and have families move to the apex area but want to stay at that school and you're doing it at the expense of other students that live in the base or kids that are coming through the feeder pattern that are living in that area of the school. So it works some places better than others. So I think I, I hear you now. I think, go ahead Bill. No, I'm just, I'm just, it, it's, not well, it's not formed well enough to share yet. <laughs> okay. I think I'm hearing general agreement that we want to increase the stability for the year-round application. Yeah. Yes. And I think we've batted some ideas around, and I, I think that's enough direction to give to staff. I'm not sure how much of that goes in policy and how much of it just goes into assignment. That's good. That's good. Okay. But that gives you enough to work on, I think, right now. Um, we have five minutes. Um, all right. An issue that I think we can do in five minutes is um, there were several places in the policy where we talked about homeless students. Do we agree to change that language as we have before to students experiencing homelessness? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay. Another another uh, quick one. Um, okay. What else do we have that's quick? Um, I think potentially. So the 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 sibling. I don't want us to tackle that because I don't think we can get that done in a short period of time. Um, I think a quick question is under D, point C, the second set, the third set of numbers, two. So this would be on page seven of 10. Um, we say applications for transfers to schools designated as close to transfers students or schools with enrollment caps. Uh, these are reasons why the administration can deny. Um, the struck out language is um, a school without sufficient capacity at a school and or grade level under temporary membership. So the following statement, the superintendent may identify schools that are in danger of requiring membership cap, mm -hmm. et cetera. I think we agree with all of that. My question that I think we should resolve is here we gave the option of grade level decisions. Everything else is school level decisions. Do we want to strike? I mean, it still could be a decision that would be made at the board appeal hearing. Right. But the question is do we want to not allow administration to deny a request? at the specific grade level as the language non struck out. So, I, so this is not, I'm not making a case one way or the other. It just strikes me that that is a detail that we might want to leave in. Well, we've used that at uh, the entering grade to Mills Park Middle, I believe. We've used the grade level cap at some in some rare cases. I'm not sure why we should remove it from policy. Right, and, and this is not just for entering grades. This is for somebody who's requesting to transfer in. Right. A reason to deny by staff could be grade level capacity. Say so maintain the expanded language that includes the grade level cap language. I'm asking the question whether or not we should do that. And remember, this is a shall deny. Yeah, this is I a just, shall. This is a shall deny, not a may. 
just want to. I may not change things, but I just want to make yeah. sure that when you're looking at it, that, that you're, you're by policy then directing that that be a denial. That may be fine, but I just want to. Well, so the question is. That they do have an appeal. I mean, they have they an appeal. always have an appeal. Yep. Okay. The question is do we want to direct staff to, if there's not room in a grade, say no, or do we want such a thing to come to the board? If there's not room at the grade, I don't think it needs to come to the board. I'm trying to understand it operationally. When, when, when does this, what is the instance in which this would be a question? Why was it struck? The school wasn't capped, but they didn't have any. No, I'm saying, what, what is, the, we have an application that's come in to do a transfer <laughs> at what point of year, for what reason, I mean, they're not in the base, the capping has been for base students. Capping, capping grade level was for base students. This is for any transfer. So is this okay, blue? so this is a non-base student transferring to another school. It's an request. application. Yeah. So the question is, should, if, if they're full at the grade level, should staff deny, the person could then appeal that decision. What I, what, what would not, where would staff know they're full at the grade level? And should staff worry about that? And so I'm, I'm arguing, arguing against myself. Well, staff routinely tell what it's, staff a, it's tell an additional like level that we party. bring to the table for an appeal and that we investigate because especially in elementary school right. because of k3 we're looking yeah. at class I size but not that. how appeal so the blue language is more general than the struck language which is more specific so does staff prefer the blue non-struck language or would you rather have the struck language back and I just had one more point I'd want to make on it. I mean, when you, when you say when it's closed to at a grade level, I mean, you're then also saying to staff, don't balance the factors. Like, no matter how compelling the hardship for the child is in that situation, you're saying deny it and let the board decide it. So, I mean, to some degree, including the shall, takes away staff's ability to look at all of the factors and say, hey, we want to do a grant here. I mean, I like the blue language that's not struck, but is a little more general. It gives. So it's not as specific. So leave that struck yeah. piece out. I I like the newer language. Okay. I'm just me. Perfectly fine. I just wanted I just wanted to raise yeah, this as an issue for us to look at yeah. because uh, that that uh, gives them some leeway. Is a specific. Okay. And with right. that, yeah. We're basically at 5:30. So it looks like we're. It will continue in the next policy. We've only got a couple of things to okay. go. All right, <laughs> yeah. we're almost there. Is it going back to the policy committee? Um, well, I think I think we'll have to come back to policy committee at the end of um, September. Okay. Because we, because I don't think we'll get to some of some of this might come out of the discussion that we do on Monday or Wednesday, mm -hmm. but um, the two big pieces that I see are Keith raised. Do we want to bring? Uh, any a, you know, ratio numbers with respect to student achievement, poverty, ta any target kind of numbers. That's a big conversation. It's a conversation that needs to be had, yes. but I'm not sure That's we do. I think we have to have that conversation first and then write policy to meet right. decision rather than the other way around. Right. Right. So and then the second issue that I think we needs to be resolved <laughs> is the sibling <laughs> issue. And that's Again, I don't think we had time today to sort of resolve that. I think my understanding from what I've heard is that we want to be sympathetic to sibling issues, but we want to be careful of the sibling guarantee that's a little bit over expansive. Yeah. Is that? Exactly. You yeah. said that we well. Want proper yeah. Yeah. Okay. We want some proper on-ramps yeah. entry points, rather, entry points. So if, a, for example, if a person grandfathered yeah. And there's a kindergartner. Right, Tell them we'll be there in a minute. That's different than if your siblings are just a grade apart. All right. So I think those are the two biggies that we've got to work on. So, so this is what. Uh, so this is kind of where I was landing on this, and I just want to make sure I'm in the right place with the board. Is that while that I wasn't looking at specifically discussing 4150 next Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday but discussing some of the concepts within 4150 that might inform changes that we then bring to policy committee at the end of September okay. for 4150. All right. Agreement. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
And with that, we will transition okay. to the action meeting. Oh, that's perfect. That's good.